Eric. Thank you. Well, welcome, welcome to Cleveland Clinic. It's good to be here. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> it's intimidating. There, there, is only, there is only one one answer to this question. Yeah, it's intimidating <laughs> and fantastic. Uh, well, we're obviously uh, delighted to have this this phenomenal building and an environment to host to host our friends. So, welcome to all of you who have come here to our Innovation Summit, and thank you very much for spending time time with us, uh, and we really look forward to, to our conversation. So I know that you know us well because we do, we do collaborate already, yep. Tempest does in Cleveland Clinic, uh, but yeah, I'm sure there's a top of mind of very many people who are looking in a world of entrepreneurship in general and look at a person like yourself and, see, and, and ask yourself, how in a world can a person with a relatively short span of time move from Groupon to Tempus. Uh, is there a link? You know, how, how in the world do you do that? You know, move from completely one field to a different field and do it with phenomenal scale, success, and impact. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I, it reminds me of a headline. Somebody wrote an article once from coupons to cancer, which was um, uh, tricky, but... Um, <laughs> So, you know, in my, in my case, um, and I think for a, lot, for a lot of people who start companies, there tends to be some uh, businesses are best or solutions are best when there's some a personal motivation, something that, uh, you know, you're trying to solve a problem that's personal to you. Um, and so in my case, I got into cancer five years ago when my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I was just perplexed at how little uh, data had permeated her care. And I, I had a weird, a weird experience in that, um, by virtue of, of the access I had, um, you know, if, if we made a list of maybe 10 of the top breast cancer oncologists in the, in the US, uh, maybe five were her doctor. So I had this dream team of, uh, of famous people. And at each turn, when a decision had to be made, uh, they never uh, fully agreed. And there was never data to drive that disagreement. Now, the disagreement wasn't that dramatic. Yeah. But I, I was thinking to myself, it's crazy that here we are making uh, life and death decisions without the kind of data that um, so many other industries uh, have. Um, the best example I can give you is we had a company, which he mentioned, called Echo, which is in the transportation business. And I, I would say to people, we're giving truck drivers picking up pallets of water bottles, better technology than we give doctors making a life and death decisions. And um, I, I started thinking a lot about why. You know, why, why is there so little technology in healthcare? And well, once I, I thought I had understood that, um, what also became apparent to me, and this was about five years ago, is that all the barriers that kept technology out of healthcare had quietly crumbled. Um, they had literally kind of disappeared. And what I could see that I think people are starting to see now is that um, technology, big data, artificial intelligence was going to hit healthcare uh, like a tsunami of which we've never seen. And so uh, I just wanted to be a, a part of that. So let me ask you uh, another thing. You know, oftentimes, obviously, we understand the personal motivation, which is very, very strong. And in our previous conversation, we just went to your, your wife is doing well, uh, which, is, uh, which is wonderful. When you find such a powerful motivation for what you do, and we have seen it in, in the health industry very many times, people really want to do the right thing and they venture into a new field, a field that was foreign to them, healthcare. Um, what was the reaction that you experienced when it comes to healthcare providers? You know, people who are professionals in healthcare, when they see a novice in healthcare trying to explain to them that they should look at their own area of expertise radically differently. Yeah, tricky. Um, how do you how do you convince them to come on board? Yeah. So the first thing, and in, 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 in what what I think people don't realize is that. As a patient or a patient advocate, when you're confronted with a, uh, a disease, um, one of the biggest barriers you have to get over is language. So for me, what happened is 
Um, you know, and I'm not one of those, I think patients go one of two ways. They either say, I just want to trust my doctor, and that's the vast majority of people, or there's another group of us that say, I want to understand this intimately. I wanted to understand it intimately. And what happened is I had this aha moment about, I don't know, three or four months into her care where I had learned enough of the core terminology that we, I was no longer speaking a different language yeah. than my oncologist. And the minute I understood that language, the, the, the aha moment for me at least was, oh my God, um, uh, what this person is saying is not um, as smart as I thought it was. I don't mean that meanly, but it was not as smart as I thought it was. Thank you. Um, it makes me feel better. <laughs> They're totally human. Um, in the case of cancer, um, uh, you know, not infallible. Like, I mean, there, there's, there's a real danger here. And so I think that was a big a moment for me. And I think it's a big barrier between doctors and patients. You know, you go to medical school, you put all this time in, you don't want to, um, you just don't want to level that playing field. It's hard to want to level that playing field. And it really takes, in my mind, somebody who's very confident when they have domain expertise to let their guard down and, and be able to have a, a, you know, a very plain English conversation with somebody. The challenge in particular that I think we, we've had that we got lucky in cancer <clears throat> in particular is that this was a field where based upon the genomic revolution over the last, let's say, 15 years, um, this was a group of doctors who um, would, would, would have had a hard time just kind of disregarding uh, technology because all of a sudden the amount of data coming at them was just too much. Um, they, you know, you could have practiced oncology without needing uh, external help 20 or 30 years ago. You could have mastered your craft. The, at that time, the guidelines were not over, overwhelming. But the minute we began sequencing patients at scale, uh, basically, every trial and every publication was tagged to a molecular signature. And at that point, you know, if I'm a doctor trying to keep up with the vastness of that very specific data, um, it's almost impossible. And so I think oncology in particular in the U.S. was the first moment that you had a group of physicians actually like raising their hand saying, I need help. I just can't do it. It's just not possible. Whereas I don't think we have that same phenomenon, for example, with, with heart surgeons, where they're not raising their hand saying, I can't do I, it. I won't take it personally. Yeah. Um, you know, they, 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 and I, or, or, or an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, they can perform their craft um, perfectly um, without needing external help from people that aren't MDs. But I think in oncology, they just can't do it. It's just too, too much. And so this opened up a window where all of a sudden you had a large group of physicians willing to engage with somebody from the outside if they would try to make sense of the ever-expanding amount of information that they were tasked with keeping track of. And that opened up a door. So I think for me it was this like confluence of lucky events. I had become proficient in a topic by virtue of having to be proficient. Um, I had crossed this barrier. I knew how to build um, scalable technology companies, and I found myself in this very unique moment in time, out of pure luck, where all of a sudden a group of MDs were willing to say, um, I'll open up the tent, come on and help me make sense of this. When we started Tempest four years ago, and I used to say to people, my goal was to have maybe two uh, academic medical centers or NCI cancer centers as partners in the first five years. If I would have had two in five years, I would have thought that was uh, a huge uh, home run. And of the uh, 70 NCI cancer centers, I think we now have partnerships with like 57. Yeah, that, that's, that's remarkable. So just to put it in a perspective, I think if any of academic medical centers of those centers were trying to form all of those partnerships with the remainder of the network, I think they would find it nearly impossible. Yeah. Has it ever been a partnership of that scale ever reproduced, to the best of your knowledge? Um, I don't know. Our general, my general counsel at Tempest is, is the, was the general counsel at Epic for eight years, uh, and so he used to say that he thought he had done, he had spent, he had done more contracts at academic medical centers than anybody. Then he got to Tempest, and he's like, okay, this is crazy, because we've literally signed contracts with most academic medical. So I think it's like uh, 75 or 80 percent of all academic medical centers. 
And uh, no, I don't, I don't know if there's anyone who's had that breadth of, of, of collaborations in place. But again, I think it speaks to this, um, this, this inevitable sea change that we're all going to be in. Uh, there will be uh, several Tempuses, um, and they, they will all have these kind of broad uh, uh, connections with, with uh, hospitals. Because it, it has to be, in order to really deliver on the promise of personalized medicine, you have to take the best of biology and the best of chemistry and marry it with the best of technology. You can't have technologists playing doctor and you can't have doctors playing technologists. You have to have them both inside one system, you know, working hand in hand. So let's just try to take it, take it a step at a time. So you have this, as you described, the fortuitous environment turned out to be fortuitous environment when you embraced on a topic that is so overwhelming from the information standpoint that people cannot do it on their own, they needed your help. Now you realize that both parties can benefit from each other's expertise. How did you determine the scope of your work? What is it to say the first, what did you decide to do versus things that you didn't really want to do? What did you decide to focus on? Because that amount of data that you can use in order to provide you know, a personalized care could be overwhelming in itself, and some may be relevant, some not. I'm just curious about how did you, how did you start? The, the first thing that we had to, the, the, the first thing that um, <clears throat> I had to grapple with or that became apparent to me is that the answer was inside the EMR. Um, the thing we all were looking for who are these patients, what drugs are they taking, or what therapeutics are they taking, how are they responding, was in the EMR or EHR. It was in the notes. You know, people have this uh, perception of uh, physician progress notes or patient progress notes as being uh, horrible, uh, at least across the uh, academic medical centers in the U.S. And we, we work with uh, hundreds of community practitioners as well, and I would say the same thing about them. The, the notes are actually quite good. There's this notion that, like, the notes are horrible. And I'm, I'm always saying, well, how do you think like, patients show up and you think a doctor just can remember what happened from three months ago? The notes are actually quite good, and they tell a story of this patient, including how they're responding to different drugs, how they're doing. And when you think about a mathematical formula or any algorithm, you're always looking for the, the answer. Like, what's the answer to the equation that you want to get to? And in our case, the answer is in the notes. We, we want to know. We're trying to figure out populations or cohorts of patients that are super responders and super non-responders. Who's doing well and who's not doing well? And then can we try to figure out what, what's their composition? In our case, we, we tend to be focused on a phenotypic morphologic and molecular data. So we look at text, images, and molecules. And a lot of the data we're looking for is just trying to understand, can we look at an image and predict a response? Can we sequence a patient and look at their molecular profile and predict a response? And you know, that's going to be the name of the game in, in kind of ever you know, granularizing these cohorts of patients and trying to figure out who you are. You know, we had this conversation earlier about uh, A1C as a yes. marker. You know, I can get a physical. We both could be the exact same age. Go get a physical. Uh, you could be 6.1. I could be 5.3. My doctor sends me home and says, you're great. Your doctor's putting you on metformin or some other drug, and you're, you're pre-diabetic. In reality, you may n never develop diabetes, and I could be having a huge problem within two or three years. But this notion of looking at one particular data point, assuming that all people on the planet behave a similar way phenotypically, is just is just crazy from a from a da data perspective. Let's try to take a step further. So uh, what we what we're speaking about now is that you have started your first step in a foray uh, with Tempus was to un to really collate and use the data already available uh, in a more cohesive, tailored way for an individual. How about this newly emerging data that? now keeps on coming on. What is your, what is your view of the, uh, of the abundance of, of data in all of the omics, proteinomics, metabolomics, and so the, the omics keep on growing. Um, how do you, what, what is the value, the relative value of that data that you, that you see from your work so far? I think the, <clears throat> the long-term value is probably high. The short-term value is probably low. We're, we're addicted, 
we could talk about why, but yes. in an in a ecosystem that values research and publications and grant money, we're addicted to the next best thing. And the last thing that we as a research institution want to do, or a medical center, is clean our house. The stage we're at from a data perspective is house cleaning. Um, I tell people all the time, um, Tempest is like a lawnmower. We mow lawns and the, the lawns are really messy. And the first step in getting data in one place is to clean it up. Where's your data? Is it structured? Can we access it? You know, what's going on? And it's boring, and it's monotonous, and it's miserable. But it's the only first step. And it's hard because people get excited about a shiny new toy, and they want to, you know, I mean, here we are, we've yet to incorporate genomic data at scale across cancer patients, and all people want to talk about is microbiomic data. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a half a decade away from having clinical utility. It's interesting, but it's just way far out there. And so I think from a research perspective, epigenetics, proteomics, um, you know, the microbiomics, it's all super interesting. But from a clinical perspective, we're still at DNA and RNA in cancer. We're at genomic data and transcriptomic data and analyzing both and trying to figure out, is this patient overexpressed in pic 3 ca Is this patient, do they, are they, you know, do they have an EGFR issue that we can address? Um, and so and if, when we're doing that across the board in cancer, when we're doing that in the context of analyzing its, the, the clinical impact of the, that profiling, then I think we're ready to go on to the next step. But um, I just think it's probably th three to five years away from having real, real impact. We spoke a little bit about the challenges for um, integrated healthcare delivery system like ours, like Cleveland Clinic, in managing, in managing the data, uh, the quality of the data, the storage of the data. Could you just share your observations about uh, how does it feel to, to work with the majority of healthcare systems and what is going to be the differentiator among healthcare systems in the future? You know, I think, um, I think it's, very, it's a tough time to be um, running a large system because you're, 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 you're going to find yourself in the middle of a giant technology paradigm shift and that is very complicated to manage. And what's, I think, really comp complex about healthcare is it's coming at you from every angle. I mean, you have cloud computing and the ability to kind of compute it at a scale that's unimaginable. You have natural language processing and optical character recognition and all the impacts of artificial intelligence on the imaging side of your business. So that means pathology and radiology will be upended. You have the ability to now generate low-cost molecular data at scale across every disease area means you have to incorporate this entirely new uh, data modality. Um, and all the while, the, the, the costs are rising, the drugs are coming at a torrid pace, the ability to analyze this data is unprecedented. So it's going to be, you know, uh, a tricky time <laughs> to be You just described my job to be running <laughs> in a few sentences. <laughs> to be running a large uh, healthcare system. But I think, um, you know, there's only, really only one, the, 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 the genie is out of the bottle, as far as I can see. There's no way to put it back. Um, and so you kind of only have two choices. And this has yet to, the, and the, the genie has yet to hit patients. So there has, what has not happened yet, for good reason, is we have not taken these technology advancements to the front door of patients. Patients aren't showing up demanding these kind of, 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 of technologies, but they will be within a short period of time. So the only thing I think you can do in the midst of a technology paradigm shift is embrace it, try to get ahead of it, um, try to use it to your advantage to the extent you have assets that can be, that can be utilized. And you know, I think institutions like Cleveland Clinic that are willing to be innovative and take risk will, uh, will do unbelievably well. And there will be other institutions that just can't handle risk, and they will, they will disappear. And um, I know that's hard to believe. If you're running a large healthcare system and you're super conservative, the idea that you would disappear is unimaginable. But I say to people all the time, I've lived through multiple technology paradigm shifts, the internet, mobile, social. These, these, these things just, they just wipe away massive businesses like they're just not there. I mean, um, 
you know, if you went to, if you went to J.C. Penney in the year 1995, you would have thought that was a country. I mean, it, it's not, they have buildings that make this look yeah. tiny. And it's just gone, you know? Sears, gone. Blockbuster, gone. Record stores, gone. Um, and on and on. So you have to just kind of embrace it, I think. And you guys are, are super well positioned because you have this massive reservoir of intellectual capital. You have an enormous number of in, super intelligent people with, with domain expertise uh, that can be utilized. And you have access to a trove of data. Yeah. And I think if, if you just kind of lean into those assets, they, they tend, they'll tend to serve you well. So the, the, the logical question uh, from, the, from the principal standpoint, I think that is absolutely clear. I fully agree. The, uh, we spoke also a little bit about uh, the ways of actually how to do this, you know, how to large, run a large healthcare organization, semi mentioned our size, 66,000 employees, seeing 2 million patients, 2.5 million patients a year, um, and doing all this work and then at the same time uh, be innovative. I mean, this is not a new challenge for any industry. Very many successful organizations are falling into that. Uh, the dilemma about how to do this right. You, you have, so to say, outlined one of the approaches that you would, you would consider or you would do. Can you just share it with our audience? In terms of? Um, in terms of you know, entrepreneurial spirit in the organization, spirit innovation, how can, a, how can the organization like ours embrace an innovation, make bets, yeah. uh, uh, you know, be on a, so to say, on a leading edge of what is, you know, be on a kind of a philosophical, speculative yeah. future of, of exactly. healthcare. I think it, you know, it really is philosophical. I mean, um, pe pe people that run large institutions t tend to, in the midst of a lot of technology, they're always thinking, uh, who can I hire? Um, how can I get the right people here to handle this problem? The, the notion being, um, I, I, I was at a large pharmaceutical company, I won't pick on them, although I want to, um, but they hired a CIO and they're like, pro as if problem was solved because they got the CIO to come there. And I'm laughing. I'm like, the, pr the problem is not, uh, cannot be solved by a person. It is philosophical. Um, you have to be willing to take risk and embrace risk. And, um, and so what, what ends up happening, I think, in these kind of moments is somebody has to say, look, uh, the world is changing. We want to get ahead of it. We're willing to be innovative and bold and take risk which means we're gonna to have to place some bets. And these bets should be you know, um, swallowable if the bet goes yeah. badly. So you know, I don't think these are $100 million, billion dollar bets, but they might be five or $10 million bets, and you're gonna to have to place a bunch of them, or $20 million, you're gonna place a bunch of them, you know, three, four, five, six bets, whatever they are, and create this self-learning ecosystem by which as you think about the future and how you might be able to, to t take advantage of it, you're placing little bets, and even if the bets go badly, there's a milestone of learning that occurred, so the next bet is better. And um, I think that that's at least a formula that I've seen that's worked well as organizations try to, uh, you know, tackle a, a space that is changing around them. And people who don't place those bets and don't learn and aren't willing to take the risk in other words, have, the, have a philosophy of conservatism and a fear of kind of stepping out in front of their skis, they, they tend to just do very badly. Uh, one, we talked about this earlier, one, a, great anal, a great example is, so I read an article, um, I'm sure someone can pull up, but if you looked at Fortune 500 CEOs in the year like 1997 or something, they did a poll of how many thought the internet would be a big deal um, and about 20% said it was a fad. If you look at the market, these are mostly publicly traded companies. If you look at the market cap of those companies in the preceding 20 years, it's like a disaster. And so it really is philosophical. Um, you, you just have to embrace change and force it, especially in an organization of 60 plus thousand employees. What's also hard, I think, very often as a CEO is when you start going layers below you, the tolerance for risk is very low. Right, they're just afraid, I don't wanna make a mistake and lose my job. There's like, I'm not gonna get a whole lot of good if I do something well, and I'm gonna get a whole lot of bad if it goes badly. 
And so somebody has to say, these are areas where I'm okay taking risk, and these are areas where it's okay that it's gonna go badly. We're never gonna get this right out of the gate, but we're gonna, we're gonna learn. What is the big bet for, for Tempest? Our big bets, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out, um, we, we understand, we have a, something like 4,500 oncologists using Tempest, so about 30% of all cancer patients in the U.S. come through Tempest. So we feel like we understand how to bring the power of big data and artificial intelligence to uh, cancer. And, and just to digress for 10 seconds, there's really um, a few ways, what made Tempest so successful, and it's, it's pure luck, I think, because I, I hadn't thought about it when we started Tempest, um, which means it has to be luck, is that you, you, um, there's a few ways you could bring AI to healthcare. So one is you could ask the doctors to go to the AI. So you could say, like, let's just use Watson as an example. Hey, doctors, go to Watson. Or you could say, um, I'm gonna bring the AI uh, into the electronic healthcare record system. So I'll bring Watson inside Epic. Both of those are very hard. Um, it's hard to get doctors who are overworked and taxed to begin with to go somewhere else. And the systems that we use, our, e our EMR systems were really built, built to pay bills. They weren't built to handle some of these issues and so it's hard to bring the AI in. Uh, Tempest fell into this notion that there was a third way to bring AI to healthcare, and that was um, what else do doctors interact with all day long? Uh, laboratory tests. They order laboratory tests all day long, blood tests, uh, MRIs, EKGs, path reports, genomic tests, and we built a platform to take those tests and make them smart, take dumb tests and make them smart, or take unaware tests and make them aware by connecting those tests to the underlying clinical data for that patient. So. We, we, we've done that in cancer and, and we continue to get market share. Our, one of our challenges is uh, how do you bring that same technology to uh, depression, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, epilepsy, so on and so forth. Um, and so we think a lot about what, is the, what are the different data modalities that have to be brought together and what are the tests most commonly used in those disease areas and how can we make those tests really smart uh, so that when a doctor orders an EKG or a stress test or when they have heart imaging done or when they order um, an A1C test in diabetes, you know, we, we're saying something that's really intelligent, uh, not only about that patient, but all the other patients that are uh, molecularly or phenotypically or morphologically similar and how they've responded to drugs historically. And I think that's the winning ticket for bringing AI to the practice of medicine in the short term because uh, it's kind of like a, a way yeah. in. So being uh, oriented towards the future, uh, what's your prediction? What, how is the landscape of healthcare providers going to look in the United States five, 10 years from now? Um, you know, I think um, we share the same, uh, I've heard you say in the past, we share the same uh, belief, which is um, the, the, the big, and the good will get very big. <laughs> uh, so I think the qualifiers, you have to also be good. I, don't, I just don't think it's about, it's not just about size, but the big institutions that are good and, and really can deliver world-class care and can leverage their size and their infrastructure and their scale to, to, to do that will get very big. So I could see a world where I'll just use um, um, you know, Mayo and Cleveland Clinic as two examples, that where there are 10 Mayos and Cleveland Clinics and, and they have a, a, a radically disproportionate share than their current share today. Both maybe uh, consume about the half a percent of the US healthcare system. Correct. I could see that number being like 3% each. So you take these top 10 uh, people and they might, they might have 30% of the system, which would be, these will be massive uh, enterprises. Um, um, you know, hundred billion dollar businesses, yeah. right? So, um, so you know, I think I think that will likely happen because it's going to become harder and harder and harder for the kind of mom and pop community franchises to compete with the with the scale of those systems if those systems can leverage uh, information and data and deliver care in ways that actually improve patient outcomes. Um, today, I, I think certainly from a surgical perspective, from a breadth of services, they can. But if I'm administering adriamycin, cytoxin, and taxotere to a patient, I don't, it doesn't make a difference if I'm in University of Chicago or 
somewhere in rural America, it's the same chemotherapy in the same dose in the same regimen. And other than an adverse event that in which you might want to be in a big hospital, the outcome response is the same. So the big systems have to figure out how to lean into their bigness and and improve improve outcomes. Yeah, for the benefit for, for the, the benefit, benefit of, of, our, of our patients. And I, I think this is something that uh, both both of both of us share this firm belief that uh, the size not for the sake of a size, but a size for the sake of leveraging the knowledge, the, the information, and the intellectual talent, uh, all of them combined will benefit, will benefit our patients to a larger extent that we've been able to benefit, uh, uh, help them today. I cannot thank you enough for a conversation. Thank you much for being here. It thank was you. very insightful. Good luck with everything that you, you do. You have done a thank phenomenal, you. phenomenal job, yeah. unbelievable job in a very short period of time. Wishing you the best of luck, and uh, obviously, we'd love to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.